Keel by Keith Brandon. The XOC units were the finest droids in the numerous system of Ste, ruled by Wigan Dynasty. They were literally indestructible, and they were sent to do all the life-threatening jobs and missions humans and other races could not do, or were sent to long journeys into hyperspace and on to complete missions. There was one unit amongst these droids nicknamed Keel, which means superb. He got his nickname as he was different from all the other units. He did not just do his job. He exceeded all expectations, saved numerous lives, and even made friends amongst humans, which was quite unusual, almost as if he had a personality. The planets in the system had always been surrounded with a purple aura that kept the planets going, and it was the reason why life bloomed and thrived. It connected the planets and the beings lived on it. It was part of the ground, spreading into it, and became part of everything. Nearly a hundred years ago, this material started to lessen from the system. The main scientists worked tirelessly to solve the problem, but could not find the cause of all this. All they could determine was that the purple material just disappears suddenly, like someone spooning soup from a bowl into deep space where no one has been before, an uncharted part of the universe that it is only briefly mentioned in the ancient archives of the stay systems. The High Council of the Systems called upon Kiel to take the journey into the unknown in order to find out where the material has disappeared and to turn it back to the system. Otherwise, life will cease to exist forever in the system. In return, the leaders of the system promised him anything he wanted upon his successful mission. Kiel accepted the mission without hesitation and promised to set things right and refuse to accept any gift. As he put it, I am happy to fulfill the purpose for which I was created and hold up to my prime directive, to serve mankind and safeguard from any harm, regardless whether that leads to the destruction of the unit. Then he added, I would be sad to see my friends die. He did not return for nearly a year. He said he only spent about a day or two in the after space, as he named it. When he returned, he was a changed person, and what he reported he found changed all our lives. Let his story be heard now. Keel sat in the control room of the ship and made the last checks on the navigation system. The relatively small ship was state-of-the-art in all aspects. He turned his face to the screen on his left. Dr. Saval Naren looked back at him with his black eye. The old, pale-skinned, humanoid-shaped creature spoke to him. Farewell, Keel. We are eager to await your report as soon as you can send us anything along your journey. I will, Doctor, he said with his vibrating, deep voice. I would never violate my directive. Besides, my friends count on me. He smiled, and it was creepy. Every time he did this, he looked as if someone cut through his face. Dr. Noren could not help it and smiled with him. On another screen from a different room, over a dozen representatives from the system's planets gathered to wish him good luck. He turned to that screen. I will do everything in my power to solve this mystery and save us all. They bowed deeply to him in silence. Keel turned back to the control panel and ignited the engines. With a switch, he remotely opened up the hangar that hid his craft. It emerged from within the metal walls and set off on its course. Its engines roared then. With a swift push, it flew off the base straight into space. Keel followed the trace of the material to the point where it had the highest density, just before it disappeared into the other world. He opened up a hyperspace tunnel and set in the coordinates to the ship to follow the trace wherever it led and pulled the lever. Most humans would have been nervous or possibly would sweat in excitement, but not Keel. His bald gray head with his blue eyes were still and sat in his chair with a cheerful, tiny smile that he always had on his face. Long roads ahead and shiny stars to dance with, while the black bed of space cradles us with dreams. He hummed the old classic song, while the big white light of the tunnel covered him and his craft and swallowed them like they had never existed. He had been in the hyper tunnel for days now. There was nothing interesting in it. All was grayish blue. In the meantime, he was working on the plans he started back at home. He wore his light blue working uniform with the Stay Scientific Institution symbol above his right chest. 
He held two laser dissectors in his hand as he was trying to join two metal barrels. He felt a tiny jolt. What happened? He asked. Writings appeared on the wall opposite him. We stopped in the hypertunnel. Why? Reason unknown, the writing continued, but it is certain that the tunnel narrowed down to such a size that it would be dangerous to continue this trip. Keel would have raised his eyebrows, but he did not have any. Unknown information about hypertunnels, he said out loud. He stood up from the table. Is there any living entity outside, he asked. No, it is impossible to live in a hypertunnel, the writing said. Well, something has certainly made the tunnel shrink, Keel answered to the wall. Send out a welcome message in all frequencies. The wall went into silence. There was a central screen built in the wall, which showed pictures of the great cities of his home world fire. This now went black, and then he could see the frozen hypertunnel. Who are you? A high-pitched voice asked. I am Keel from fire. Who are you? I am the tunnel through which you are traveling. How is that possible? There is no record of a living tunnel in all the civilized worlds. Well, there is now. How did you get in here? I opened it. I was following traces of the purple material. For some reason, it is being sucked out of the planets, and eventually all life will end. Ah, the nectar, the tunnel answered. Yes, a new cycle will start. That is the order of things. What does that mean? Keel asked. You still have not answered my question. How did you get into the tunnel? No one has ever entered here since the start of time. As I said, I opened a portal, following the purple thing. Hmm, unusual. Perhaps there were some cracks left open. I have no record in my endless existence of anyone entering in me. Where I am from is where life starts and ends. Keel turned his head slightly left. You know where the Creator is. Uh, there is no record of that. Life has begun, been existed, or changed forms. Only the Scythe Man would know. But that still does not answer your impossible presence here. The screen elongated from the screen and pulled up to Keel's face. A face formed and examined Keel's. There is something unusual in you. Well, I am not human or other race not even organic. I can see that. What are you? I am a droid, an artificial intelligence. Never seen your kind. You said no one has ever entered here. How do you know any race? There were some instances in the river of time. Some with great purpose or desire have done the impossible to get here. Why is this place hidden? The tunnel face frowned. You have a purpose. Yes, I have. To serve my creators, the humans, my friends. Something more to it. Never mind. I have made my decision. You have to meet with the Scythe Man. You cannot leave until he decides what is to happen. You can't hold me here. Yes, I can. You become a ripple in the river of time. You change the course of things. That has consequences. You have to correct it now and set things back as they were. I notified Scythe Man of your arrival. Farewell then, Maid Man. It is unlikely that we shall see one another again, which is unfortunate. The screen pulled back, then returned to its original state. Keel felt another small jolt. What happened? he asked. We are out of the hypertunnel, said the writing on the wall. He looked through the window in the control room and saw the eternal space with the shining stars dotting the black cover. No planets or star systems seemed to be nearby. He put the autopilot on and went back to his table to continue his work on the steel barrels that could be of some use for the humans to use on spaceships to shrink the hyperspace time to half than it is nowadays. While working, he enjoyed listening to an opera from fire when something dramatic happened, such as a betrayal, for instance, he always turned his gray head slightly left or right as he had seen this reaction from others who took him with them to see magnificent opera productions. Bastard, he said to a character, when he tried to murder his beloved wife caught in the act. A jolt happened again. It was bigger this time and shook the vehicle. 
What is going on? he asked, turning his head to the white wall and pressing a switch on the table to pause the opera. We have encountered a physical barrier. The craft hit something that is as yet invisible. Damage? Thiel asked. Negligible. The autocorrect system will be able to fix the problems, though it may require some manual handling. Excellent, he acknowledged. Go reverse and scan the barrier. Yes, Captain. While the craft moved back, Keel entered the control room and sat in his chair. The control computer lay directly under the windows in a half-circle shape. Anything? Yes, there is. The space is moving. The writing appeared on the wall just beside the control panel, and Keel could see what the computer was talking about. The space moved towards them, all the black velvet and the shiny points. He grabbed the edge of his seat. There was a collision. The space moved back. Keel did not understand what was going on. There was not such phenomenon recorded in the entire space systems since they began the space travel, and that happened eons ago. The space in front of them became white, and all the black and the stars had gone. Something shook the craft. Sparks flashed out from the panel in front of him, and also from the walls. The ship moved upwards as if it is being lifted. All he could see was white. Then two golden spheres shone through his windows. Then they narrowed, like two eyes. What are you? A frightening deep voice roared. Keel, however, knew no fear. A huge white creature lifted the ship up to its face. It only had two shiny eyes and a shiny looking mouth. All his body was a, a white sort of mess. It poked the ship twice with one of his fingers. What are you? It asked again. Please, do not shake my ship. You will destroy it. Keel's voice came from a PA speaker. Ah, ship, the creature said. I have not seen one in a long time. Who, what are you? Keel asked next. I am a guard in the afterspace, it said. But my friends call me Mai. Keel thought that perhaps the creature felt some sort of pride when it introduced itself to him. Greetings, Mai, he greeted the creature. Where are your friends? They are guarding the other entrances of the afterspace, but this is confidential. It will have to be wiped from your memory. Why is it confidential? Keel asked. Come out of the ship. I want to see who you are. There is not much to see. I am a droid, the finest, according to my creators. And intelligent, like a living creature, Mai added. A minute later, Keel appeared on the side of the ship, which lay on Mai's palm. As a droid, he did not have to wear any suit, only his boots were magnetized to stick him to the ground. Mai lowered his head as close as he could to examine Keel with his big, shiny eyes. Why is this place top secret? Because this is the afterspace. This is where time began long ago, and this is where it ends. Still, it is unusual. How did you get here? And why has the tunnel let you come this far? I am here as a representative from my home planet, as something is taking away the purple material that surrounds our planet, the very material that gives us life. I am here to find and reverse the course of it, if possible. Ah, that. Indeed, it is the way of life in this universe. It has been since the existence. And you have a noble task, a noble reason to find it. Maybe that is what the tunnel saw in you. What do you mean? Keel asked. There is one important rule that only a few understand. To seek out a secret and solve it can only be done with the purpose of helping others. Those who hope to gain control of it for their own benefit will corrupt it. They who made it here before you had only the hope to gain control. They failed, as I had to destroy them or had to send them back where they came from with their memory erased. Those in their world have long perished. I understand. I am here to save my people, if I can. That is my prime directive. To serve mankind and safeguard from any harm, regardless of whether that leads to the destruction of the unit. 
I am asking you for the chance to do whatever I can to turn back the flow of the material and to save my people. That decision is not mine to make. That has to be done by the scythe man. I do not see any false purpose in you or the will to deceive. You seem to be different. I will let you pass. Whatever happens now, it is all up to you. I thank you. Keel acknowledged and bowed his gray head. He was in a different place. Stars and the black velvet of space remained the same. As far as he could see, dozens of different colors and their shades of rivers flowed from a high place above him, down like waterfalls, then disappeared together at the bottom of the colored steps. He stood at the bottom of a silver-colored stairs, leading way up high. He started to walk up, though there was no invitation for him. He was not nervous or excited, rather curious. After leaving the 789th step, as he counted, the scenery did not change a bit. The colored rivers still fell noiselessly, though the light that came from the top of the stairs seemed closer. After a while, he arrived at the top. What he had seen could not be compared to anything he had recorded previously. An immense cloud had filled the horizon as far as the eye could see. It changed color frequently and displayed all color that exists. It was a sight to see and to take in. The cloud moved, became smaller, and then bigger as its edge took different forms. Where Keel stood on the sides, the rivers of colors flowed slowly, then fell off the edge of the top, like a real waterfall. Keel looked ahead. Far away, he saw a shadowy figure in front of the cloud that seemed like shoveling something and turning side to side quickly. He could have used his droid vision to get a closer look, but somehow he did not do it. He walked toward the figure. The cloud got bigger and bigger the closer he walked. After a while, he could see the figure in more detail. He wore a shiny blue dress, which rather looked like an armor, showing different color all the time. The person had human face with white hair and an utterly smooth face. Still, he looked aged. He had some sort of tool in his hand, which appeared to be a hammer on a long stick. As Keel approached, the guy looked up and looked at him. Ah, oh, finally you are here. Be welcome in the afterspace. Not many make it here. He laughed out loud. I will be right back. Keel did not understand what had just happened. The man's shape blurred and stretched to the far distance, and then back in a second. Yes, I can be distant if I want, if I need to tend to my duties. It is one of the abilities I possess as the scythe man. You look like you swallowed a crampon. He laughed again. But where are my manners? I am the scythe man, or as the others call me, Benf. And I am Keel, from Fire. Pleasure to meet you. Who are the others you mentioned? Ha, not so fast, my friend, Benf said, raising his voice. Knowing it all at once will leave you empty and sad. Trust me. The last who made it this far did not listen to me and jumped right into the rivers to find the ultimate truth of all. And what happened to him? Keel asked. Benf leaned in closer and whispered. I guess he's still looking. He laughed again, hitting Keel's back. His face went serious and sort of sad waving his hand. Sad story. I am also here to seek knowledge and answers to save my people, my friends. Benf sighed. All who come here wanted the same as you, but I am afraid I can't help. Why is that? I am sure that by now you've figured out what are the colored rivers? Yes, the materials that surrounds planets and worlds and keeps them alive. Indeed. But we just call it the nectar. There are rules by which the rivers were created and hold their very existence. There is a cycle here that has to be maintained. Can you explain? Of course. The nectar in this whole place was created by the one. He brought planets and worlds into existence, sparked life in them with the nectar. The nectar is the very thing that connects those worlds, and without it, there is no life. The one gave these worlds a purpose, to thrive, to prosper, and to achieve great things. This is done, usually, in hundreds or thousands of years, 
until a world or a race develops itself to the point where they can achieve these things. But when the worlds are turning into a different direction, and using their minds and abilities to conquer and gain power, then the purpose of the nectar changes and flows back into its origin, here. This is incredible, Kiel said, an amazing creation. But this leaves those worlds to their death, even if it is not happening right away. Yes, it is incredible. The process is slow, of course, to leave time to the people of that certain world to realize they're doing something wrong and reverse it. But, Ben sighed, most of the time, the worlds perish in their ignorance. And it is changing color. It became lighter and lighter. Good observation, Ben acknowledged. Did it start to change in your world? Yes. A few others and I noticed it. I am sorry to hear that. But I have to say, not all creatures and men on these worlds are evil. Most of them want to live, thrive, and help others to live. There must be a way to change this. I can't watch my friends die and have all those things perish that we built. I admire your passion and heal toward your friends, not least because you are a built machine. But it was not me who wrote the rules. The one did. He is the only one who could rewrite the book and change the course of all things. Is all written down in a book? Yes, it is, Ben answered. May I see it? A strange thing occurred to him. Excitement had gone to his brain right after he asked to see the book. And he was a droid. He was not supposed to have feelings. Ben laughed even louder than before. You are a bold one. <laughs> and what exactly are you expecting to do with it? I want to read it. Might there be something it says that was misunderstood about the rules? Something happened in his head. It seemed as if the excitement would gone to his brain. Ben laughed up even louder than before. I have to say, I have not had this much fun in at least a whole millennia. But then his face became somewhat sad. I have to read those rules every 500 years, my friend. And they are all the same. I am sorry. I can't change the course of the universe. Kiel somehow felt it would be useless to argue anymore. I understand, Benf. He sighed. Do you mind if I see the book? at last, before I return to my home. I promise I will not steal it. He smiled with that creepy smile he had. A sudden calm embraced him. He felt that everything would be okay. Ben smacked his fingers. Ah, to hell with it, why not? I guess you deserve it. He said a word Kiel did not comprehend. But from nowhere, with a flash of light, a book appeared and levitated in front of him. It was made out of a brown-colored material, which his sensors could not analyze. He took the book in his hands. On the top of the book, there was a shiny emblem of a circle with two lines drawn on the sides. The lock of the book clicked, and the book opened. Ben stood there in astonishment, while Kiel held the book in his hands as if this was the most natural thing in the world. Something happened to him. The artificial mechanism stopped its function, and his emotionless face changed into another shiny face. Benf recognized that face and bowed his head. Welcome home, my lord. Welcome, the one. Greetings, my friend. It is a pleasure to see you after such a long time. The time has come for me to visit places of origins, and I see you have carried out your duties, for which I am grateful. Thank you, my lord, Benf said, and lifted his head. Now you wish to change some of the rules, he said with a small smile on his face. I think I do. I have lived amongst these creatures and man long enough to see that there is hope for them. They deserve it. He put his hand on the open page. A minute later, he closed the book and it clicked again, signaling that it locked down. You are giving them too many chances, Ben said. 
You would too, if you'd live among them. It's so much fun, Keel said. Is your memory to be wiped again, my lord? Bev asked. Only about me being here as the one, he replied. People find it very hard to accept that one of their fellow man is the one chosen for. Indeed, that is true. And I will return again when times get desperate. But of course, my master, Benf acknowledged and bowed to his master. His face disappeared, and the emotionless droid face took shape again. Farewell, Benf, he said. It has been an honor to meet you, as it was mine to meet you. A moment later, he was back in his small spaceship, sitting in the dining area. Welcome back, sir, the writing said on the wall beside the screen. I hope your journey was pleasant and satisfying. We could say that. Set a course for home, please. Right away. And the small ship slid into the unknown hypertunnel to take him home. When Keel returned to fire a few days later, the nectar, as we began to call it, now that we know its proper name, returned, and we got our planet back to its full potential. Life returned to normal, sick people recovered. Keel became a galactic hero, upholding his prime directive and exceeding all expectations. Statues were made to honor him, though he did not show a slightest interest in them. He remained the Keel we knew, yet somehow different. As he stated in an interview, I am only your friend and am here to help any way I can. And all the recordings he had from his journey were played throughout the system. Most of us believed it, some not. Even us scientists had to accept the facts that were presented by him. He accepted to undergoing an utter scientific investigation, but nothing was found that would confirm any alteration or anomaly in his mechanics or memory banks. He asked to change his face, to have a more human face, instead of the gray display that had served him as his head and face. He said he wanted to become more like one of us. To this day, he has remained in the Alliance System Science Division, and yet works tirelessly to make our worlds a better place. The hypertunnel he traveled through was never found again. We searched the coordinates where the nectar flew and disappeared, and tried everything within our technological level, but nothing worked. Possibly it is for the best. But it is good to know that we have a way ahead of us to develop and achieve great things. And also good to know that there are higher powers who sometimes watch over us. And thus, we can have hope for ourselves. Dr. Saval Naren, head of Alliance Scientific Department in the Stay Systems. System time, 3408. End.